Hi everybody here. Hey. My name is Farvez and yeah, we are from Students Era Podcast. So today we are with the MU1 Club in uh, Harriet Watt and uh, let's, everybody can introduce themselves. So hi, uh, I'm Asa Ali Khan. I'm the president of this club and I do mechanical engineering which is weird but it's still fun. <laughs> <laughs> hi, I'm Marvin Chatrani. I'm the VP of this club and I'm currently doing business uh, and business management with marketing, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I think uh, I've really enjoyed the club so far, mm -hmm. like under our leadership, but it's just, you know, we're trying to make it better every single time. Right. Hello, uh, my name is Aram, and I'm an architecture student, first year. Yeah. And um, I, th I wasn't really, I'm not a political person, but because of the, of how the rest, the president, the white president, made it so interesting. The light, I had to join it, mm -hmm. and I love it here. And I've really had a great year. Mm -hmm. Looking forward to more years. Yeah. Hi, I'm Jani Jaswani. I'm also an architecture student, and I think uh, MUN has been one of the most enriching experience of my university life. And uh, it gives me a really good outlet, and uh, it also gives me a kind of break from my regular work. At the same time, <laughs> at the same time, it uh, it helps me just stay aware of what's going on in the world and what's being done to actually remedy that. Yeah. Hi, my name is Mohammed and I'm an I'm also an architecture <laughs> student. Uh, in addition to what Adam and Charlie said about the annual club, uh, it's given me a lot of uh, exposure to you know public speaking, improving my public speaking skills, mm -hmm. and I've had a good time here. Right. So, um, MUN is actually, it's a very uh, niche demographic when it comes to like public speaking in general. Mm -hmm. And uh, usually they consider the geek slash the nerds or somebody who has a lot of free time <laughs> or uh, yeah, who's really into reading and into politics and into economics in general. So what was your first experience with MUN personally that made you fall in love with the whole process? Yeah, and I'll actually explain from the beginning, um, you know, there's a, <laughs> um, world has gone through different stages uh, from, you know, at autocracy to aristocracy mm -hmm. and at the moment it is going through this phase called infocracy. Mm -hmm. So people who are well read and well informed about stuff generally tend to perform better. Mm -hmm. And if you see MUN, MUN is like a field, modern United Nations, it's like a field where you have to be well-read to compete with others. Mm -hmm. Now, well-read in the sense you have to know everything about the current affairs, you have to know about the history of different countries. It's not related to one country, so you have to like read about every country in the world mm -hmm. and have to know what's like what's happening in some random internal elections in, in Italy mm -hmm. while you're an Indian or you're Pakistani so it, it's not like um, you're too free to read that but this good to be well informed mm -hmm. okay and what made me love MUN is the way people speak over there and the art of diplomacy. Yeah. Okay, diplomacy is an essential life skill mm -hmm. and you won't notice this art in any other university activities other than MUN. Yeah. Because when you're going and when you're participating in some MUN conference and you're representing some XYZ country, you have to speak accordingly to them and you have to please others right. even though if your policies are poles apart but you have to convince them to get on get on board with you right. so that part attracted MUN, mm -hmm. me to MUN. Right. Um, I have an interesting question for you Anna. so it's very easy to have opinions and it's very easy to like form a view or like a model uh, when you read news or something but uh, MUN demands a certain amount of nuance to what you know and like when you take positions because you're on the world stage right now, model world stage. Um, how would you balance between having an opinion and like trying to factually approach a matter or like or an issue or an agenda? That's actually a very good question mm -hmm. and um, it's, it's, it, at, at times it gets really hard because mm -hmm. you have your own opinion and your, and your opinion on topic that's totally against it. Right. Um, maybe I think to be fair, when you do your research and you and you learn about it, there's always a good side and a bad side to mm -hmm. to 
um, each story, every each topic. So even if you're going against it, there there will be still some points that will be beneficial or they'll be good. So that's how we try to balance it. That okay, there is this point to it that you cannot totally go with your opinion. You some some way need to be neutral. Right. So right. That's yeah, the only thing you can do is just research and research more because the more stories you hear, mm -hmm. and it's not just the news outlets which will give you the information because yeah. even they can be biased. Yeah. So even very very personal accounts, your research can come even from someone who you met on the street. Right. But then even that can affect how you would represent that country at a global stage. Right. Which is, I think, which is the most interesting part. I mean, I remember Anam, uh, she had gotten a country where uh, one, of her the, one of her domestic helpers was from that country. Right. And uh, she got a first-hand account from her, which kind of influenced how she would represent the country right. at the global stage. Right, right. So research is the only thing which you can do to mm -hmm. avoid getting bias. So... How would you differ between like uh, this sort of NUN research and like general quote unquote research like other than like Wikipedia and stuff? But what would be your most uh, first hand sources basically when you start for preparing for any NUN? For the research thing, I think he is the best suited person to answer. <laughs> <laughs> like, what is your approach? Mm, well, my approach usually is like, what's the objective? towards the end of that conference like you know what is it that, like you know wants to be achieved mm -hmm. usually it's different for every every single country like some want the status quo, quo to continue and like there are others that want particular changes to happen because it's working in their like in, in their disinterest so it's always about i always t i always tell them that like you know think from you know from from that country's perspective like go to Wikipedia, understand exactly how people think, mm -hmm. think and like view the country and how they view the UN. Right. And that will give you an that will give you a notion on how they'll actually respond in the UN. Mm -hmm. Like you see a lot of uh, powers, particularly like we have North Korean delegates in the UN, where they're always sidetracking mm -hmm. the whole discussion. <laughs> they're just keep sidetracking the discussion, but that's exactly what they're supposed to do. And mm -hmm. uh, when I was in Switzerland, that's exactly what the uh, what you call North Korean delegate did. Mm -hmm. And it was so enjoyable mm -hmm. to see that he was following <laughs> and sticking to his policies. But like at the end, he did get an award for it because he was like true to whatever he was trying to portray as mm -hmm. his country. And it made a lot of sense. There was also other countries saying like, you know, the whole point of this debate was like, irrelevant because mm -hmm. I was in UN Women mm -hmm. and for them like you know that topic was extremely controversial right. and so they were trying to just you know try, trying to show like you know show shame onto the committee and like you know this is a complete waste of time so mm -hmm. you need that's what I try to essentially focus on is like you know what's your country's objective is it just to avoid the situation altogether mm -hmm. you know get into the depth of it of like you know understanding like every single point like you know of how we can make this better for other countries and other people who might want not want to accept it right now. Right. So that's that's my portrayal of it. And like I think in the beginning I gave them like a briefing about just general politics. Mm -hmm. So like you know why do we prefer democracies than a good dictatorship? Mm -hmm. uh, why uh, what you call the different thought processes of like you know different systems like liberalism, conservatism, mm -hmm. uh, realism on the overall so. Yeah, I think just giving them that brief and then telling them to go read up is pretty much the only way you can go. It's like they have to get into their head like what the country is all about. Right. Yeah, adding on to that, like um, so one of his techniques is to to learn about the entire country. Mm -hmm. There's there's this website called CIA Factbook. Right. So if you go to that website, it gives you every detail about that country: its political system, its population, its economics blah 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 mm -hmm. stuff and adding on to this experience of North Korean delegate I <laughs> tell you a personal experience which I faced uh, so in the beginning of this year we participated in the AUD immigrant and I was in security council right. and I was representing China mm -hmm. so and the topic <laughs> was, China and the topic was yes. South China Sea that is yeah <laughs> and when I started researching about South China Sea and stuff, whatever China's points which were there were all skewed. Mm -hmm. The only reason China is still able to garner power and hold people off is mm -hmm. because it is for it is China. Sorry for the question. <laughs> <laughs> it's because it is China and has a melting might in this area. Mm -hmm. 
while everything and we got like good deals with philippines thailand and stuff because it tried to bully them with trade policies right so if you see everything there is against china and over there all the members are being for my blood and what should i do to defend myself mm. do exactly what china does mm. basically beat on the bush mm. and keep the blame on others so what i did was i started fighting with the us delegate mm. saying <laughs> what the past uh, crim kind of criminal activities which us did like how it uh, doesn't respect the sovereignty of other Uh, countries mm-hmm. i even went to the fact of the nsa spying which usa does upon the rest of the world mm-hmm. so what i said was if mm-hmm. um united states has warships mm-hmm. placed near south korea mm-hmm. a country which is which has a history of not respecting boundaries and country which has a history of spreading democracy and freedom and we know how well the democracy works mm-hmm. so what do you expect china to do so china will be ready with its arms because they are like giant warships over there mm-hmm. so i kept changing the topic i kept changing the goal post over there because literally everything was against me mm-hmm. and they got so pissed they got so pissed because i'm keeping i am like diverting the topic again and again mm-hmm. my placard was stolen <laughs> Yeah, and every was, resolution we came up with five resolutions he vetoed all. <laughs> yeah, and uh, also my country was United Kingdom, so right. due to the very very unstable political situation over there, I was in a position where I couldn't come into anything. I couldn't say anything. All I could do was follow USA and just mm-hmm. hope something would come out of this. Mm-hmm. So every resolution would get out of five permanent members, it would at least get one veto. There was one which got all five vetoes. Wow. No, it's, no, it was actually three That's resolutions. Just, yeah, one Russian delegate ran away. There was one that Russian delegate who ran away after the conference. <laughs> oh, so no, no, what happened was three resolutions. The first resolution nobody vetoed it, and I vetoed it because yeah. obviously it was against me. Right. The second resolution they all knew, like okay, what the mood was and what I'm going to do. So I vetoed it, and they didn't even raise <laughs> the third resolution. <laughs> They wrote it themselves, and they knew I'm going to veto it. So before I even veto, they themselves vetoed it. Because nah. it was all by all of the smaller countries. All hmm. of the smaller countries got together and attacked everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're lucky representing UK in a mock UN instead of a mock European Union. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Are you in or out? <laughs> <laughs> you, should you be inside the room or not? For me, confusing the 